Okay, here we are. Hey, this is Anthony Parent of Iris Medic, and thanks for joining us today live. I am with uh, Miles Wakeham. I want to start off with we'll go a little introduction, sort of how we uh, ended up here, and um, starts back in 2009, um, and my life really changed. I was away in a tax conference, and I got a call from the office. They said, hey, some guy has $7 million of unreported Swiss bank accounts. Is this the kind of case we take? And I said, sure, yes. Um, and I had really no idea what it was about. Um, and then I learned like, what's this F bar thing? And so that's what I learned about it with my client. Um, and the thing is, no one really knew about it at the time. And what that led to was a, a movement to take my tax practice to the international realm because I found it so interesting. And, and really, uh, one of the things that just drew me into it is the clientele. Uh, the most interesting people in the world uh, tend to have activity all around the world. And a lot of them tend to be U.S. persons. And so... It's just been truly, truly an honor uh, getting to know people and being often very impressed and very humbled. So with that introduction, I want to bring you over to, to Miles. Miles is an Australian-born immigrant, child prodigy, tech entrepreneur, record producer. It kind of goes on a little bit here. And before I let him go in here, because this is really what I, I just... This this is this is really me. I want to just get up. I want to get up. To, I wanna, I'm going to pull up his podcast screen here. Um, and do a screen, screen share with the uh, screen share with um, this here. Let me get this here. Um, here we go. This is just amazing. Um, this really, did you get the right, did you get the right screen share? Yeah, you did. Okay, great. Um, this is what I like here. Beunconstrained.com is the story of Miles, Miles Wakeham, a contrarian, an immigrant, and someone who's questioned the social mantra from childhood. His stories, his discoveries, his results are fascinating. Miles has no job, is financially independent, lives in multiple countries, and pursues opportunities, projects, passion throughout the globe. And so with that, my friend, um, I want to talk. So you did not grow up in America. So I want to get to the point. What drove you to become American? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm an oddball. I'm not from round here. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, you could perceive that as international man of mystery or you could perceive that as some guy who's just an outcast and doesn't fit in. Uh, both is probably true. I think, firstly, the, the perception when I was in my 20s when I first came to the United States, and this would have been late 1980s in that period, it was a very different perception of how the world was. We didn't have the internet back then, so... Everything that was learnt about the United States was learnt basically through Hollywood. So you would you you would watch a movie and you would see a happy ending and you would go, oh, that's where I want to be, right? That's I want that too. <laughs> I want that too, you know. Um, and it's funny that even in the in the narrative of Hollywood in the late eighties, we started even questioning that because you started to see movies coming out that represented. Uh, people who had come to America and didn't necessarily find what they were looking for. Um, and that was an unusual narrative, but it resonated. And I guess Hollywood picked up on it and made a bunch of movies like that. But, you know, this is at the time when Australia was going through this unusual perception in America. Crocodile Dundee had come out and we had a lot of... Now, uh, who's serious? Don't... Oh. Yeah, there you go. We and, and, love. Yeah. Right. And then in music, we had like Men at Work and Midnight Oil and all these bands were starting to get some prominence and air supply and things like that. And so all of a sudden, Australia was kind of this curious little exotic, weird place. But when you think of it from somebody who was from there, it's a big island the size of the landmass of the United States. It has only at the time, I think it was only like 15 million people living there. So imagine the population of like the greater Los Angeles living in the entire United States. Wow. That's, that's Australia. Uh, you become at one with nature very quickly because there's a lot more nature than there is humans. And so there's, which is why we, we, you know, celebrate our weird diversity of animals and marsupials, whatever. And, and, and we're also very respectful of nature because we realize that it's bigger than we are and it'll kick our butts if we don't behave. So we have to kind of have a balanced, you know, life with this. Um, anyway, back to your question. Why come to America? Well, I wanted – so I became a big fish in a small pond. And this is not uncommon in anybody who grows up in a small town. 
you know, you go to a certain level where you think you can go up to that point with whatever you do, and then you realize you've hit the, the, the glass ceiling, if you like, or you've hit the limit. And it's unusual, but very few people who become noteworthy and successful in, in whatever their endeavor is tend to do it in this small town. They leave and they go to the big city and that's where they came. Well, for me, living on an island with 15 million people, there wasn't much of a big city option. So I did not expect to come to the United States, although I had the same fascination with the US that I thought was a Woody Allen movie. I thought that that was, you know, Manhattan, right? I thought that was what it was like, this romantic concept of a, of a place in which I could succeed or something. But it wasn't until I found myself uh, unexpectedly uh, in a relationship and married to a US person and living in Los Angeles uh, in a place where immigration at that time, which was, I guess, the INS back then, uh, they had the policies that if you landed there and changed status, you could not leave until they completed the process. And now you're living under the world of the government and their bureaucracy and how slow they take to get anything done. And you can't work and you can't move. You can't leave. You feel captive. But eventually some bureaucrat, you know, presses the right buttons and gets you the, the right paperwork. Um and that was kind of my life. So for six months, I was living in Los Angeles, trying to understand that what I saw on the movies and the films of Hollywood didn't represent the streets of Hollywood, where I was walking around and, and starting to become kind of at one with the place. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it was very different uh, reality to the perception of what the, the average immigrant would perceive of America. Okay, so your perception of what it was, you know, obviously, you know, we're all, you know, I think I, my perception of being a lawyer was formed by Hollywood as well. You know, reality was a little bit different. So you, you, you have the perception land, America is the land of opportunity. Well, for you, <laughs> kind of worked out. Uh, so that was actually a lot of truth to the, uh, a lot of truth to the mythology for you. It ended up working out for you, right? I mean, yeah, it, it did. But understand that it's uh, that's not always the case here i mean i australia is on the other side of the planet right you, you know it, it takes 16 hours in a silver tube to get there and it's it's a horrible process i've done it so many <laughs> times yeah but it is what it is and so when you get there australians are very welcoming of anybody who's willing to go through that sort of you know burning into that the door into the burning buildings per se but the truth is when you're down there, the buck stops on your desk. So you live in a world where if your car breaks down, you fix it. And that means you learn how to fix cars. If your roof is leaking, you learn how to fix your roof. If there's a, a bushfire, you learn to how to, you know, protect your property with water. I mean, this is normal for us, at least it okay. was when I grew up. So, so would you say being able to figure out how to do everything yourself um, is something that pretty much that, that, that really led to a lot of your success later in life. Yeah. I didn't realize how powerful that learning was. Uh, you become a jack of all trades and master of none. But in my particular case, once I, I learned the basics of my trade and survival, uh, I then started to profess in areas which were timely. Um, and uh, so I'll, I say this as a regular conversation point and lesson, if you like, in what I teach in my podcast. But um, I learned everything I needed to know about life as a surfer. And this is going to sound really weird I because I never finished I high it. school. I, I didn't even graduate high school. So how is it that this schmuck here who didn't have the traditional education or whatever was able to be successful, financially independent, all that stuff? How, how did that happen? Well, because what happened was when I was a teenager, you you kind of everyone in Australia lives by the ocean. And kind of what what we did was my mates and I would go out on the weekends with these surfboards. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. And we'd go out and wax down the board and go out and think we we're all going to be this great, you know, mega surfer. The truth is that the waves kick your butt and through and it hurts and the surfboard hits you in the back of the head. And no one <laughs> told me about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean... 
And day after day, you're just beating yourself up out there trying to learn how to not fall over and not make a fool of yourself and not drown. And there's always the risk of some shark somewhere. Sure, I was so going to say we're in Australia, so we have to mention yeah. sharks. So it's it's always just like it's part and parcel, but you also realize that you're still the quest is to go out and have that ultimate ride. And eventually, I think it was about three or four days into this total immersive experience that I realized sitting out there on the ocean, there were patterns. And what I could see were there were patterns in waves. They come in sets and you would pick the wave out in the distance. Yeah. And, and then what you do is you position yourself for it. And I started realizing there's something to this. Like if you, if you put yourself in front of the wave, not when the wave's on you, but ahead of the wave, and you point towards the beach and you start paddling like crazy, that wave comes along and it doesn't see you as, uh, as an adversary. It sees you as a synergistic object to itself. And it literally picks you up and it transfers its power to you and all of a sudden you're part of the wave, right? This is amazing experience that you're riding down this wave and you're just going, holy cow, how did I get the power of the universe given to me like this? And it's simple. I was not an adversary to it. I was synergistic. But more importantly, I was ahead of it. I, I picked my battle ahead and I started paddling so that it would pick me up and it took me with it. And I realized right there and then, that's everything because that's money, that's wealth, that's stock market charts, that's buy low, sell high, that's everything. And I just said, oh, it's about timing, it's about preparation, and it's about going out and getting wet and being engaged in the water. I'm not going to be rich sitting on the beach watching everyone else have a good time. I have to go out there and I have to beat myself up for a few days to eventually get it and realize that that's what you do. So what happens? I, I use the exact same metaphor and everything else. I bought real estate when it was cheap and waited for the wave to crest. I bought Bitcoin when it was nothing and waited for the wave to crest. I bought stocks, whatever. I bought everything that way. And I'm going, I didn't need to graduate high school to know this. I need to just get wet. <laughs> so that, that stupid analysis that, Australians take, you, you now put yourself in like Manhattan or New York or LA or wherever. Mm. So that's and how you're perceiving the, the same, world with that model. Right. Apply the same model to that. And you don't need to be a PhD at Harvard for this. Anybody can. And then so when they say oh, America is the land of opportunity, it's like, well, the universe is actually the, the place of opportunity. It just so happens there's a lot of wealth here and there's more of an opportunity for you to grab some of it. You blew my mind with that. That was awesome. I love that. I love that. And now I realize why I don't have the success in surfing um, because exactly <laughs> it, it, because when you're, you're not in the right spot, you're kind of fighting. Oh, I missed that wave. I got to get to do that. But they come in sets and you don't have to be on the water that long to realize like, yeah, it's going to be like three and it's the middle one. You, the middle one I'll kind of go for. And it's not when you don't read the shore right of knowing where the brakes are, you're in the wrong spot. You're, it's breaking mm -hmm. on you or yeah. you can't get on it. And it's incredibly frustrating. And this is what I would say that I'm not a, I haven't served too much, but this is what I would say if I was going to apply an analogy from something that I am a little bit more familiar with is road cycling, uh, road racing. And there are some strange things that happen in a group of guys uh, racing. One thing that happens um, invariably is that, and in of in course, you'll have places where it's incredibly difficult to move up, and everyone's fighting tooth and nail. I gotta tell myself to move up and get the gap forming, get gap forming, and yet you'll find a place on the course where it's it's actually easy to move up with no effort because no one else is pedaling, mm -hmm. and it's every lap. And the good racers know that, like, dude, don't 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 try it when it's going hard because you will burn yourself out. Just wait. Wait, and they're going to do it every single time that people don't understand the, the things that are influencing their behavior. And if you could step back to say, oh, actually, they are. They're, they're influenced by it. And if I just am not influenced by the same thing, now I see this in a different way and the opportunities show up like, oh, yeah, go now. And, 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 and the social proof, what will happen, is, oh, no one else is going up, so I shouldn't work hard. And I was like, no, no, that's that's exactly where to go. Um, so, so I, I think there's there's absolutely a lot to learn. And I love I love your your analogy. Now, 
I think we should probably move into to sort of the whole topic of what we're talking about here. Like, you know, America being special. Now, this is where I'm a little bit down on America right now. And this is sort of where it started our conversation off that has been doing, you know, I've been doing a lot of international taxes. And if you watch this channel, you know that, uh, you know, we have some great guests, John Richardson, saying, hey, the best time to renounce your, your, your citizenship is right now. And so it gets a little bit confusing. We're not sure exactly, you know, what should we be doing? Should, you know, is this is America still all that special of the place is, is the question. And from my perspective, I got a little down on it, but um, you have some key insight here. And this is really, I think, the point that I want to show that that sort of made me rethink about, uh, oh, wait a second. You're right. So, OK, America's got problems, right? Well, yeah. What's but the part, yeah. What's the part we're not seeing, though? OK, so when you're an immigrant and you want to come to America and you realize that the Hollywood story was a lie and that, you know, you got here and I mean, you don't look back in anger. You sort of say, OK, but why exactly did I really want to come here? And you start realizing that it's because of one thing that is in itself the reason why Hollywood exists. And that's American ingenuity and creativity. That's uh, something very alien and something that most uh, Americans would forget very quickly. If you've ever grown up in a country which has, um, you can't question the rule of law, you can't speak out, uh, you have every sort of form of, of repression being subconscious, sometimes overt, sometimes covert, but you just fear speaking your mind, you fear expression, you start understanding why America is a beautiful place because that that's the key part of this. Um, one of the things, I mean, I've been a creative person since I was born. My mother stuck a violin under my chin at the age of five and I was in the symphony orchestras at the age of 11. So I've had, I've had a very creative background. And in addition to that, I, you know, became a technology guy, a software developer. And so, I've understood creating something from nothing that, you know, that whole world that used to be the, the Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak that anybody could in their garage create Apple. Well, the, those days are kind of gone now, but I loved the idea of timing. And again, it was part of the surfer mentality. If you, if you understand uh, getting in on something at the ground floor, it's like picking up that great wave when it's, you're in front of it, you know, and that's kind and of what. By the, the time people see you on the wave, you already have the momentum behind you. Like, right. Oh, I need to get on it too. It's too late. You can't get on. You're not exactly. On it. Yeah. Exactly. It's like the Steves knew that, right? They knew timing was everything, and that's what they did. They took advantage of that, and their successes, their small successes they had, became the drivers that that led to bigger successes and bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually they were the giants. And you know, history tells that story quite well. But right. I mean, I, I, I wanted I, that. I was talking with a, I was talking with a client this week, earlier this week, about the Today Show. He's he's watching it right now, and this was a quote that that he that he sent me. I'm, I didn't get your opinion on this yet. This is mm -hmm. what he said: I live in several countries and notice that Americans just assume things can be done and do them, which is major to people from other countries. Correct. Yeah. There's and, no. I mean, you couldn't do that in China, right? Everything needs some yeah. sort of permission slip. Everything, even in Australia, which is. I mean, I don't want to come down on my homeland, but, you know, it's a social democracy that is, we, okay, we have a thing there. Uh, I don't know if this has ever come up in conversation with anybody you've spoken to. We call it the tall poppy syndrome. Does that ring a bell? No, 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 no. no. Okay, so the idea is that in a, a field of poppies, that, you know, this massive field of poppies, that no one plant is allowed to rise above the height and level of the field. If it does, there's a thing in nature which apparently it pulls nutrients out of the root system and kills the plant off or reduces it back down to the level of everybody else. That is Australia. That is also the British Empire. It is a very commonly found syndrome in most British uh, Commonwealth countries. You will see this. You, you cannot rise above the level of your peers without taking the arrows for it. You will be wow. the target and it's nasty. And it turns you into a, a person that says, why bother? If, if my friends and my society won't let me succeed, 
I'm not going to be the odd one out. That hurts. I don't want to do that. And then my government looks at me and goes, oh, I'm a perfect candidate for tax extortion or I'm a perfect candidate for enslavement or whatever else. And then you end up like living in this world of like, ah, whatever, I'll just wait for the football on the weekend. Right, what do I care? I'm just going to get through and I'll phone it in and, you know, that's my life. I didn't want that life. All right, to me, the the essence of birth and death was, was finite and that I wanted everything in between those two moments to be at maximum level. I wanted to live that life. I wanted those experiences. I wanted those stories. I wanted those adventures. I was not going to get it in a country that said, don't do anything odd because we'll, we'll just pull you down. We're just going to make your life living hell. That was hard to take. You don't get that in America. You come to America and you, you succeed in anything. Society around you raises you up and says, I want to be like that guy. That guy's good. That guy we should celebrate. That's the guy who should get all of the attention. Not, and, and the second oh. that we lose that, we've lost the, the genesis of what, builds power and strength and in this particular case empirical power because because if you if you can take that across 330 million people imagine what it's worth it's huge it's powerful that's why people want to come to america they want to come here they want to be free to take risks they want to be free to do what's in their heart they want to be free to live a life of meaning they want to be free to be able to be supported by the people around them that will prop them up. And they also want to be resonating from the people around them who themselves are doing better things than they are. And they want to be able to feed off that. We rise to the level of our peers. So if we surround ourselves with the best and brightest, we will become that, right? That is America. Yeah, right? that I, I love having you on the show, by the way, just uh, <laughs> a slide aside. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Um, so I mean, and this is this is the word that this is the word that I recall because I, I was I was mentioning to another friend I was mentioning into the car yesterday. I said, "Oh yeah, hey, tomorrow's going to be really good. We're going to be talking about whether you know America is special." And I said, "I asked him. He, he's an engineer." And then now this is and this is where I sort of got optimistic about America. Um, he he is a uh, an engineer and he's a VP of a company. And really, his his key to success is that he gets the little things right. Um, the engineering part, he says, oh, that's easy. It's all the human relation stuff. That's that's the trick. Goes, that's that's actually the trick. It's adding that little bit of human relation and, and knowing and, and, and anticipating people's needs. And so I asked him, I said, so so what do you think make, makes America great? He goes, oh, we're, oh, we're crazy at, at reinventing ourselves all the time. And I, and I laughed like, yeah, that, that that's really what Miles was saying. It, it's exactly that. And so he, as I was thinking about it, I was like, man, he saw that right away. And now that I see that, now he said that, um, I'm thinking of that. Oh, oh well, that's everywhere. It, that 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 American inventiveness is, is everywhere. And then I started looking at it in my own industry. I said, wait, wait a second. We have this tax code. That's the most complicated thing in the history of the world because it's American inventiveness fighting American inventiveness. Mm -hmm. The American inventiveness is the thing that created this massive, massive structure that. Even if you don't like it, you got to be a little impressed with it by by its size, its scope, and that they're still able to make it function with the massive thing. It's still really impressive. So there's a ton of American inventiveness that went into this thing. And likewise, there's a, a tremendous American counter <laughs> inventiveness. Like, how do we deal, deal with this, this terrible thing? And here's an example um, that, you know, we do a lot of tax resolution and calling the IRS is something we have to do. Now, in, in true IRS in dysfunctional fashion, uh, the Republicans cut the budget. And this is before. We're, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about current stuff, but this has been going on for years. The Republicans won't fund the IRS just to answer the phones. But hey, look, we're not talking about enforcing anything. We're just trying to talk about the customer service. So when someone says, hey, where's my refund? There's someone to pick up the phone. Or hey, there's an error. There's something that happened. The IRS staffing has gone down um, each year. And so your hold times get up to two hours long. Now, what the IRS does for you is they give you a courtesy disconnect. Well, they don't want you on the phone all day, so after two hours, they'll <laughs> hang up on you and you don't get started again. So as you can imagine, this is one of the most obnoxious things that you have to deal with. You know, the, the call itself can be kind of, you know, like you look, you're, you're dealing with government speed. Um, you have to probably upload a fax to them and you're going to be on with that, with that. So a simple call will probably take an hour with the IRS no matter what. But you have to do two hours a whole time before that. Well, thank goodness for American ingenuity, uh, there's a service, uh, 300 bucks a month, and there's no hold times. 
you just call a number and it puts a code in and I use it. And, it, it, it it's, and so I was thinking like, yep, this is it. So, and I think that's in, in that you have someone like me, and this is also interesting. You have someone like me in the tax industry and you say, well, why? And I don't like taxes, but I see the opportunity. It, well, let's see here. It's something people can't stand dealing with uh, that most people don't have the, the ability to stay with the code and read it and understand it and fight it and know where they're wrong. Um, so, and it's like, well, it's just something that affects the wealthiest people in the world and every dollar that they make it when they make it. So it's like, well, that seems like a good place to be. There's a lot of opportunities. So even the tax code is driving me into it. But now the IRS has a response. Oh, boy, now we're getting these tax professionals. Okay, we have to respond. And so it's that sort of balance or fight that we're having between uh, the inventiveness of both sides um, as we're going along. And I think it's like, who's going to win? It seems like uh, uh, we make a move, they make a move. And now they're kind of grinding to a halt a little bit. They're having problems, uh, significant problems in it, as it's sort of coming at the scenes. So that's what I see. Um, now, now that I say, so, I mean, would you agree that's it? It's the, oh, actually, you're the one who told me that. <laughs> Where do you see it? Where do you see that American invent, inventiveness? And maybe things that I, I, you know, there, there it is. There's the American inventiveness in the tax system. Where do you see the American inventiveness just sort of blow you away? Well, uh, I think it, it happens in so many different areas. I mean, you could almost say in almost all forms of industry, there's, a leading American uh, driver somewhere in it, whether it be uh, in the sciences, in the arts, in in finance, in, in all these forms. The problem I think, I think, and where we may have lost our point and lost our mission, is the mission itself. The American mission, uh, as compared to missions from other countries, and I, I say the word mission as being a, a philosophical purpose of doing something. A venture, a business has a mission statement. And then to support the mission statement, it does what it does. And it looks back and says, are we on track? Are we meeting our mission? The American mission, the strategy is focused around money, capital. It's focused around acquisition. It's focused around keeping it. It's focused around making it. It's focused around getting the best value for it. Um, and the problem is that it has gotten to the point where, and this is going to make me sound a little hippie. So, I'll oh, I'm ready for it. Oh, oh, okay. well, I want to hear it. Oh, now it, listen. <laughs> leaning in on that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, it, it's one thing to be wealthy and rich, but on your deathbed, that's not going to be important to you, right? Because at the end of the day, you're going to look back and you're going to say family, and you're going to see regret, and you're going to see all the things in your life that this one and only life that you have. If you devoted it all to looking at spreadsheets and balance sheets all day, you would feel pretty damn miserable with yourself. And I, I think that we get to a point where there's a, a responsibility that we all have for our own uh, existence, our own survival. But I'm a big fan of Albert Maslow and his psychological studies, the Maslow hierarchy of needs, the concept of a, a pyramid where at the very bottom we're in survival mode and it's all about food, shelter, clothing and not dying. And then as we get past that level in our lives, we, we become more industrious, more communicative, more family, more healthcare oriented, more preventative. And eventually our goal is to get to the very top of the pyramid and to, in Albert Maslow's words, to self-actualize. <laughs> right. So the, the idea is that from the top of the pyramid, you can then look back down and you can feed down. You know, you can be philanthropic. You can be a teacher. You can be a wise person. You have a message to share. And that our goal is to get to the top of the pyramid. That pyramid is not built on dollar notes, right? It's not yes. built on bills. Yes. It's built, it's built right. on experience and it's built on embracement of risk and understanding and learning and wisdom and and maybe it's spirituality is a part of it but it's built on all of these things which we put aside in pursuit of the almighty dollar it's it's look i i was raised as a christian kid i'm not a practicing christian but i can tell you one thing jesus didn't tell you to do that right no. i mean and yet that no, is the, no exactly no he didn't tell you to do that though no, he said actually how is Right. Yes, how how is that like a, not yeah. a dichotomy, not a, a, a complete a 
opposite let's be opposite day all the time and do exactly the opposite of what we believe in ourselves to be to be a good upstanding person i mean we've lost the plot the mission is wrong the mission of the quest of dollars forevermore whether it be by government who spends more than they have or by individual who is willing to sell their grandmother out for a buck i mean we've got to stop this and at some point all things in balance it's like in nature everything has to be in balance you cannot eventually live this illusion to the point where you can pretend away all of the things in the universe you can't it'll come back and bite you in the ass and that's the biggest problem we live in a world right now which is very 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 poor in philosophical and 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 written and we're not rich in spiritual self we're rich maybe we've got more money in the Dow than ever before and all this sort of thing. But I guarantee you die on your dead bed. You don't give a crap about that. It's not going to matter. Yeah, no, it's not. And I, and I think this is sort of where I'm thinking is, you know, and maybe this is something that, that, that I've been doing and I guess you've been doing as well. And maybe a bunch of other people doing it as I, as I talk around as, as a lot of people sort of got, got off the whole bandwagon myself. Hey, look, I was on at one point. I was on that and I'm like, yep, one day I'm going to cash out and then, yep, I'm going to retire. Just, I don't know what I'm going to do all day. Um, but I was like, yeah, that day, that's when I'll be happy. And then that's when I'm going to work on all the problems I have. You know, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll, you know, and then I'll take those opportunities, you know, to get back into music and do all that. Like once, once that day comes and then that day, you know, it didn't come. And what happens is, is that you start disconnecting yourself from people, the very thing that got you that success in the first place. And so as it is now, what I'm trying to do is, is take that inventiveness and this is take the, that American inventiveness in order to help me decouple my definition of wealth from the U.S. dollar. Um, now, as a tax attorney, I, I really love that idea because, you know, uh, that's a great way to avoid taxes. It's just like, well, sure. I don't have any income. Uh, it was wonderful. It, it was a wonderful thing. Um, and that's where I see, uh, I think a lot of people are, are starting to see that. And, and this is what I would just say, like, consider, you're, you know, when you're defining your material wealth by that U.S. dollar, it, you're really, you're really engaging a lot of fiction. Okay, because one thing is you do not control that U.S. dollar. Okay, uh, what your U.S. dollar is is dependent on what the supply is, and you don't control the supply; someone else does. Um, and so it's really not anything you control. We see that inflation happening, and people are acting like it's a mystery. Oh my God, how are we going to fight this inflation? Well, it's too late. You already printed the money, and actually, the, the solution to inflation is to destroy the money with high taxation. So uh, have fun with that. Uh, so we really need a solution to this because you know this this invented this how do we do it and i think that is really the way and a lot of maybe different social structures that we are all sort of in our own little island and, and we have to do this but if you belong to a community um you can get a lot of things done and um and i realized i sat back down you know and, uh, when i was feeling sorry for myself last month or something like that i, I sat down I was like i'll oh, actually uh, uh, you're incredibly lucky. Think about all the things that you get just because your friends give them to you. And like, oh yeah, I actually, I get the best things because it's far, 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 far more, uh, uh, entertaining to have a friend's like, oh yeah, here, come to my show and here, I'll get you in. And you know, it might not even be a big show, but it feels like you're a part of it. And you can't like, no matter what, I don't care how much money you're spending for the front row tickets of whatever show, you're just merely a consumer. You're merely a consumer. You're just another consumer. And that's the part where I think it is where we, we got to get away from that, that people are just expecting to be a consumer. It's like, okay, well, someone's making money off of you when you're a consumer. You're not creating your own wealth. And it's changing that mindset to where you create your own thing. So if you create your own entertainment, um, <laughs> you need less money. And now you could be free. Oh, okay, well, I don't want to do the thing I hate to do. Uh, I don't want to go to the place I hate to go. I can just do this because I reduce the demand of what I need to consume. And because I'm creating and the time that I'm creating is time I can't be consuming. So when I pick my head up, I'm like, oh, hey, look at this. I, I didn't spend all that money on dumb stuff I should have. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm doing a little bit better. So would you have any suggestions on how to apply this, you know, inventiveness to get us out of the trap that 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 dollar trap that that you certainly see i've certainly seen i don't want a part of it i don't want to 
I don't want to be working my life and I don't want to be sacrificing and missing out on something really important because, oh, there's U.S. dollar. There's some digits in a bank account somewhere that I'm going to be concerned about and I'm going to have them rule my life and make every decision. So you have any ideas on how we could uh, use our American inventiveness to sort of free ourselves from our own? Yeah, yeah. It's very simple. Um, so firstly, uh, don't let me say that conservative fiscal policy is something I embrace and I accept. And, and I'm very happy to proud to say that I do that because I come from the country where the buck stops on your desk and you better learn to fix your stuff. Right. So I, 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 I relate to that. What I don't relate to is the endless pursuit of it because the endless pursuit of it uh, takes me away from the things that are more meaningful. And I had to learn what those things were through near-death experiences and the whole bit that, you know, we've all gone through in our lives. Well, I have. Um, but in the end, uh, going through these sort of things and then realizing what's life like on the other side of it is an interesting observation. I am lucky enough right now to be uh, a resident of uh, Mexico. I have a big property in central Mexico where I spend a lot of my time and I'm surrounded. I'm lucky to be in an expat, a US and Canadian expat enclave in this area and I'm surrounded in a town of like 90,000 people, 10,000 of them are expat US and Canadian people and Europeans as well. So English is commonly spoken in those areas. Uh, and when I speak to a lot of those people, I find common threads that there is a certain percentage of people who felt like they had to escape where they were from and they went there. There's another percentage of people who did that by desire because they either couldn't afford to live in the United States anymore, they couldn't survive on social security or their health care was going to kill them and, you know, financially and, and they were going to lose everything. So they went to a place that was less expensive. So after you get past that initial, how did you get here conversation you have with somebody over a glass of mezcal or whatever, you start getting into the why are you here and who are you really and your conversation leaves the world of I used to be a banker working for Goldman Sachs to I'm actually a painter. I'm actually a writer. I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I'm a playwright. I'm, I have this quest of creating something. I, I'm here to, to do that. And that's when the conversation gets interesting because it's at that point they start revealing their true self. Not this artificial, you know, survivalist mode I had to get past all this. But what happens once you've survived? Because I believe that life is not a Boolean experience where you're either uh, 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 you know, in survival mode or you're rich. You're not this 99%, 1%. You're you. And you're doing what you want to do. And you're hoping that you don't, you know, you can afford to do those things without being constrained. Well, those constraints, 90% of them are self-inflicted. We make the choice to buy the McDonald's. We make the choice to buy the furniture at the store and go into debt for $20,000 to have the nice recliner. We make the, the, the choice to buy the Tesla and carry a $50,000 debt for a vehicle rather than fixing the, the old Corolla we got in the backyard. We make those choices because we perceive there to be some advantage to us. There is no advantage, right? There is no advantage. You just need the result of those things, and then you can transcend it. But we don't attempt to transcend it. And, and this is scary to me because when I find people who actually have transcended it and I have conversations, they are deep. They are powerful. They are meaningful. They are life-affirming or life-changing. And then what happens is that you take that, that mental thought, that concept of what's life like if you didn't have to worry about money, and you start realizing, that's a retiree. That's right. They're on a pension or they've got social security or they've got an IRA that's paying them an annuity or something. And the money they've forgotten about, what now? And then you come face to face with it. When I was 22, I had to bury my father. He worked for 40 years in the same job in a building construction site. And he retired at 35. He was dead at 37. When, that, when I had to do that and I had to go through and unravel his life and put it all back together again, I immediately said, there but for the grace of God go I. I am not going to live his life. 
I will not be the company man. I will not be the, the, the infantry soldier on the field. I will live my life to the fullest I can live because I cannot end up like that. And that's been my mantra. But then when I really unraveled it, I, I put everything in reverse and I said, 65-year-old retiree, that's weird. Let's go back in time and work out how did he get here? And he was a good man. He, he supported his father. He looked after me. He did all the things to, to give up all of the choices he had at a younger age and defer them later to a point where he was not allowed to cash in, right? It didn't happen. And I go back to all of these, mis these mistakes and I realize, you know what? I want to be traveling the world when I'm 30, not when I'm 60 something and I've got a bad back, right? I want to be out there in the moment when I'm young. And the point is that how do I get to that place? Well, if all I'm going to do is spend 50 grand on a Tesla, I'm not going to be that person, right? Um, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, Elon, you've done nice with your inventiveness. And here's another example of an immigrant who did it here, yeah, yeah, couldn't yeah, do okay. it in South Africa, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the thing is that despite that, I think he knows as much as anybody else that if you commit yourself to a mantra, to a social mantra from the age of 18 where you're sitting at the kitchen table and your parents slap down a, a debt contract for a federal loan to go to college and you don't know what the hell your life purpose is yet, you have no business signing no, that thing, do that. right? Get, you, get yourself a one-way ticket and go and travel the world and be a bartender in Tokyo and then you'll start understanding what life looks like and then you'll come back and know exactly what you want to do. And that's the problem. We, we enslave our kids at the age of 18 in debt they can't get out of. Then we put them into a 30-year mortgage, which, by the way, the French translation of that word mortgage is death contract, right? Oh, right. So, right. Right, more, right. Exactly. So if you start understanding <laughs> that they want to slave you into a debt contract where you can pay interest to somebody until the day you die, you're my father. And you shouldn't be like that, right? This is how you don't get ahead. And at the end of the day, I'm now ranting on this, but at the end of the day, what it means is that you lose purpose because all your life you're on the treadmill, all your life you're focused on money, 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 everything I've got to do, paycheck to paycheck. Oh, I've, I've, and then all of that FUD that's in the media like, oh, do you have enough money to retire? Do you have $2 million? No, because you, you didn't need $2 million because if you were living and pursuing your true purpose, you wouldn't need to be spending $50,000 a year to do it. Yeah. I mean, Nothing makes any sense to me. And as an outsider, I look at it and go, crazy time here. You know, this is wrong. Well, I love the, here's the, here's a phrase that I don't like, but I think you, 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 you really nail it on the head. There's an artificial survival mode and that you, you just articulated the thing that I see. I see it around me. Um, and actually a client of mine described it as this. We, we were talking about, Hong Kong. He goes, oh, Anthony, do you go in an office in Hong Kong? You go, ah, no, no, I'm not going to do that. There's really no need for me to, to be down, you know, to have an office down there. I'm not, I'm not going to take up to, to travel there. Then he just said, well, he goes, you know, um, yeah, Hong Kong, the land of more. And then I asked him, like, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, I asked him years later, what do you mean by that when you said the land of more? He says, well, it's like this. He said, if you go to Hong Kong, it's as if everybody is, they're acting like their heads are held underwater. And everyone is like in this death panic. And so when you said artificial survival mode, I said, that's the concept. And so I see it around here a bit. I live in Connecticut. And if, you know, we go down to Fairfield County, there's a lot of consumption and there's a lot of, there's a lot of traditional wealth. And I actually have a hard time being around it. It just, it just drives me nuts because what I think is going on is that you have people who are, who are living in that artificial survival mode. Like you're going to be okay. The only thing that, 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 that you're hurting is you're sort of worried about your status, but who cares? Like, why do you care so much about that? You're going to be fine. We're all hyped up about, oh, oh, you know, like this. And what happens, and this is really what I see. And I have a friend in, in, in social work and he sees it a lot, uh, is that the, the children uh, pick it all up. And so mm -hmm. the kids are all walking around in this artificial survival mode. And that's what I kind of probably picked up to a degree as well. 
um, we're just sort of inherent in us and we're, we're sort of panicking uh, beyond belief. And this is the thing that, that, that exactly, this is the thing that, that, that convinces uh, uh, an 18 year old kid to sign a contract. He doesn't even know what it is. Well, I better do it because my parents says I got to do it. And my life is going to be nothing without it. And I, I'm just trying to survive here. So, hey, let's try to survive. I got to do what I do to survive uh, without really thinking, with, without thinking through. And so that is where I think it is. It's like, why do you need to spend that money on it? Tell me how that helps you because you're worried about your survival, right? And I think we're not willing to accept that. We're not willing to say we're in survival mode. Like, no, no, I'm just working hard to enjoy life. Uh, well, let, let me let me throw a theory. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Yeah, I got to hear okay. it. I got to hear it. All right. So um, if you if you ever see somebody at the airport waiting for their flight, uh or anywhere really these days, um, they usually have their head stuck in their phone. Yep. And I think that the reason for that isn't so much that social media is addictive and we all like that affirmation, you know, addiction of likes or whatever it might be. I don't think it's necessarily as much as that. I think what it is is we've lost the uh, sensitivity to ourselves and we're scared to address it. No one looks at themselves in the mirror and has a conversation with the person on the other side of it as much as they do that with everybody else. And we don't ever have the time. I, I, people fear going out into a field for two hours with no phone, with nothing, sitting down and thinking, right? When you get to a place where you fear that, you've got some problems because you can't fear thinking about yourself and your regrets and your hopes and your dreams, they should be amongst all things. They should be the first thing that you think about. But we don't. We take every opportunity we can to distract ourselves from that. And one of the greatest distractions is the 40-hour work week or 50-hour work week or whatever it is these days. People take jobs because they don't have to face their true purpose. They don't have to answer to themselves as to why what their life really should be because it's easy. Somebody else is telling me where to focus and the, and the companies are really, really good at reducing distraction. They'll have policies about, oh, you can't surf Facebook on the computer during the day, or you've got to be in at this time and you've got to be out and there's deadlines and we've got to meet deadlines. And, and it's like a total immersive experience where you're in this world, this artificial bubble that isn't you, but it's, it's a script you're playing like an actor on a screenplay. You're, you're following somebody else's direction. You never question who that person is. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's a corporation. But you get into this treadmill. You've got to stay in there. You've got to stay in there. We, we both need it financially because we're in this, as you say, artificial survival mode. But at the same time, we welcome it because we don't want to face ourselves. We can avoid facing it. I learned one thing in life that very early, and, and it's always served me well, and it's a simple statement. The rich don't have jobs. Okay, that's it. Okay, you, the rich don't have jobs. They don't. They own things. They you, own assets. Uh, that was always, yeah, Bob, as I, you know, the subject of uh, uh, income taxes and, and brackets come up, and I always said, if you're working for a living, you're not rich. No. W two people get screwed in taxes. Kidding? Yeah, the no, people like, don't are getting the long term capital gains tax rate. Right, exactly. Like, no. like, not only is like the, the worst kind of income to have is earned income, and you know there's not a lot of strategies we have for that. There's a lot of strategies for other stuff, business for portfolio income. We have tons of strategy, um, but for earned income, it's like uh, max out your uh, your retirement. Okay, that's about it. What else we got? Uh, yeah, not you got any big anything big to donate? Maybe okay, that's what we need. There's not really anything to do, and so it's and, and I, so that's one of the things too is I, I find I guess an irony that that we actually have a tax code that is sort of aligned with with what our beliefs are that you really want to think about creating things that can generate wealth and generate wealth that isn't measurable in U.S. dollars, um, and those are you know. And, and it's funny. I, I think about the best times of my life, and like there wasn't a lot of money involved in any of them, and they were never the hype thing. They were never like, oh, "I'm going there this weekend, and it's going to be great." I'm going to be disappointed. I know, it's, but it's always the thing like, "Oh, oh, what happened?" Uh, not a lot. We were just in a river. We were in a stream all day long, and it was great. Best day of my life. I don't know. <laughs> I was just like, "We're having fun." Um, right, right, on. right. It's like, what did it cost? Nothing. And then not spending money also enhances the enjoyment as, as well. Um, 
we this is I, I I gotta say this is an amazing conversation, Miles. You really you really are something, and I think your theory is absolutely right. I think your theory is right, is right. Um, I did uh, I I punished myself years ago. I might have smashed my phone on the ground in a fit of rage. Uh, that would never happen again. Um, and in order to punish myself, I made myself go without a phone. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? I I'm just too much rage. I'm not gonna buy a replacement phone. And so ultimately I did because my staff was a little annoyed by me not being reachable ever. Um, uh, but I enjoyed, it was uncomfortable at first, but I really enjoyed not having a phone with me and that, okay, Hey, look, I'm going to stand in line and wait here. Okay. And I'm just looking around, observing things, seeing what I could do. And you know, everyone else is just like this. And it's like, you know, cause you don't have to, you don't have to address those things. And, and as far as you're talking about that job, that's exactly what you, the, the, the dread is that you are, it's really not you and you're adopting something um, that isn't you and you're throwing away most of your life. Uh, or, or I don't know, throwing away, but, but you're not getting that much out of this great gift. Um, you're not really, seems to be all that helpful. So, wow. Uh, I am, uh, uh, really, really thrilled. Now, oh, here's I don't I want I don't want to go uh, without talking about this because this was something part of our earlier conversation. How does artificial intelligence play in this? Here is it's this is you know I'm con and as a as a tax professional I am bombarded with messages. Get I AI to improve your tax. You're gonna everyone's pop on board. It's the latest thing. Hey, get on board the bandwagon. Um, so I'm actually not uh, not going to use AI. I've, I've looked at a lot of it. There's places for AI, but I don't think that um, it's really a substitute for the thought. Um, and it, it could be a tool, but it's not the end all, at least as I see it. What, what would you say about AI? I, I have more of a dystopian view to the whole thing than, than most. Um, I've lived with four or five decades of technology since I was a kid. I bought a computer in 78 and rode that wave uh, and did really well. And I always thought that it was a, an admirable path to try to take the drudgery out of people's lives, that repetitiveness, the, the, you know, but I watched bit by bit industries die off as a result of it. The typing pool, the stenographer, eventually spreadsheets replaced, you know, bookkeeping and, and, and so on. So there are a lot of good things that came out of that. We thought at the time that jobs would be lost and people would be desolate. The reality was they found, you know, m much more interesting things to do in other areas. Um, so one could always argue that any technology displacement that would be out there in society could have positive impact uh, as it had in the past. The problem in this particular case, though, is that the impact is uh, we stand on the shoulder of giants. And the giants that are before us uh, are very, very tall. And what artificial intelligence has done is it's taken an industry of inventive, creative people uh, at the decentralized level, and it's forced them to be centralized because you can't run big data centers with high performance computing. Right. Uh, you, you can't afford that in the garage of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak's parents' house. Right, that's not going to happen. You you need to be Google, you need to be Facebook, you need to be Amazon, you need to be Microsoft, so on. And and so what it's done is it's a consolidation method for the tech industry to be able to do much like what the auto industry did uh, after the emergence and eventual uh, consumption or com commoditization of the motor vehicle. Um, we went from probably hundreds of different car manufacturers down to ten, and then down to five, and eventually now we're all looking at Toyota, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GM, you know, there might be maybe a dozen, there's a few Europeans thrown in there for good measure, but we're not in that world where anybody can go and invent a car. I mean, it, it takes, it takes enormous effort to do cars. that. There right. were a lot of cars back then, a lot of weird names that, uh, Vauxhall is what my, right. there, there, right. there's one. my, my, my grandmother had one, almost a car. There was like, yeah, it was Close to being yeah. a car too, uh, and that got bought by GM. So I mean, it's just another part of yeah. The, the thing is that, that that consolidation, which slows things down, forces us out of an inventive mode and into a maintenance mode. 
And so we've lived in that world in the auto industry for a long time. Yes, cars have gotten better and more reliable. They're more computerized. They've taken advantage of, of all these other things. Our roads are better. Our fueling systems are better. Um, th th there's good things that come out of that. But at the end of the day, we haven't for 100 years changed the concept of a combustion engine. And to be honest, the combustion engine is what built the US empire. Without that, we would have been the British empire with steam. And now with the US empire with combustion engine, what's going to happen in the future? Well, it's probably going to be fusion energy and whoever owns that is going to become the next empirical force. But the, we're not there yet. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that AI is a way for us to defer to the machine uh, so many parts of our humanity and our creativity and our inventiveness that became part of the American exceptionalism, the real exceptionalism, not the debt enslaved US dollar kind of, you know, dystopian view, but the true heart and the heartbeat of the country, the culture of inventiveness and creativity has been, as you rightly say, used against us in some way. And in this particular case, co-opted by a bunch of nerds who have created machines that uh, allow them to pretend that they're gods. And at the end of the day, those very inventions and those machines, which themselves will then stand on the shoulder of giants of the machines themselves, and we eventually get to this world of AGI where the machines start understanding, start emoting uh, things, they start becoming predictive animals. They they tell you what you're allowed or not allowed. And we end up living in, a, in an episode of Black Mirror. And that's not a world I want to see. We have never in the past, that was always science fiction. It was so far away from us. But I can tell you as somebody who works in technology or has worked in technology and still has a very close association with that, that we are so close to that point of dystopianism that we in a matter of a number of years will take away certain things from our humanity which we crave because once you've transcended the need for money and then you end up becoming an, an artist a poet a, a musician a, a a writer whatever it is that if machines will do those things better than you well, what's the point and that's the key problem is it, oh, it's a it's a okay, seeding yeah. of what right, I get it. Yeah. And then we lose the exceptionalism that is the creativity and we don't get off the couch because I could be, you know, a, a great poet, but what's the point? Some, you know, chat GPT will write a better job than I will ah, play Xbox. Right. Why should I learn Photoshop if I can just get chat GPT to make a better image for me? Why yeah. should I do any of this stuff? All my stuff is very amateurish and not perfect. Why should I learn any of these, these little things? I'll just get an AI bot to do it. Yeah. It's not about, wow, money. yeah, no, it's I really, a, yeah. I, 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 I really see, I really see that, that, that being incredibly destructive because a lot of the things, and this is what I try to encourage my sons to do is, is to make those mistakes. Try something out, try a little business, try to see what happens. And then you'll see that, oh, okay, you, you learn something, but mm -hmm. without those little moves constantly. And that's, I think the thing that has helped me draw upon, um, find success is that all the weird things that I've done that have nothing to do with anything. I just, oh, I, have, I happen to know this because I, I got interested in this. And I'm like, I see the application here. And so there, there you go. It's because I have a lot of back, you know, and let, just so you have a varied background, a little bit more probably than me. Um, but those awesome tools that you pick up on all those little things that you do um, that maybe didn't, maybe didn't go anywhere. But it, 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 this, is, this is what it did. It transformed your understanding of the universe by doing well, our thing. role in it. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand the universe, but I understand at least I have a better perception today of my role in it to not to be synergistic with it and to not be an adversary. Yeah, yeah. To it. Right. Yeah. They, they, I think that's wonderful. All right. Well, we're, we're just about out of time here. And I just want to thank you so much, Miles. I, I, I just uh, awesome, awesome uh, episode. And uh, your project, you want to just uh, tell people about your project going on in Mexico? This is this is. Uh, pretty cool this is beyond cool uh <laughs> wow uh this is uh like the, the, uh, yeah please explain what's okay going on. so in a nutshell uh we bought a uh property an acre of property that used to be a matador school with a full-size bullfighting ring on it 
uh, and we demolished it to turn it into a uh, haven of human creation. And the biggest part of it, there's a big house where my wife and I will live. And there's a very large facility down there, which is a recording studio uh, for music. And I've, you know, being a musician from a young age is kind of part of parcel of my own journey. It represents that. But more importantly, it represents a, a place where humans can be uh, frail, can, can be, uh, you know, uh, can make mistakes where they can expose the wor the, the best and the worst of their, wow. their world. And they can, an artist can create things without fear of, in a place where their courage is allowed to thrive. Whoa. That's what I want. And so I found that this world of, of media, wow. as we had turned it into in 2023, lacked the history of the flaws of a great Beatles song or a great Bob Dylan song where his voice sounds like crap, but my God, the message is there. Yeah. And what I wanted was I wanted a place where people could embrace the best of their of themselves in and and have yet all the tools technologically around them to do it so i went back in time i discovered the studio in the caribbean uh in the 1970s and 80s built by sir george martin the producer of the beatles uh, air studios montserrat i had reached out to the people on the island i had met the people who built the studio uh it's a studio now that was destroyed by a volcano and hurricane and and all these kind of biblical <laughs> events that happened down there but i managed to get a hold of uh some of the history of that and i'm building an exact replica of that studio in san miguel de allende in the center of mexico uh, for artists to come to and to create an environment in which they would want to be there as opposed to you know doing recording on their laptop i mean a place like that a place where they feel surrounded and and in a place where they can really produce the best work of their lives. Because if we if we don't do things like that, yeah, an AI bot will come and create the music for your YouTube video or for your, you know, for whatever. And and that's we're losing ourselves. And somewhere in the middle of that, we have to keep it and we have to protect it. The word that sends shivers down my mind, my my spine, when you said this that where you can be frail, and I'm like, did I hear right? Did he say frail? And then oh, I did that is compelling that i am so excited about this to 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 be a lot i mean the, the art that you're going to capture the art that you are going to capture it's going to be powerful stuff you know that, that you know those are always the things that we respond to the most is when someone is just wow they, they mean it and they're out there like that, that they're being real and they're exposing their flaws and they're okay with it they're telling you what it is uh that is an amazing concept i and just looking for, I, I, I'm so excited for you. Um, by the way, Miles has a little bit of a background too. He's just not like, you know, a guy like me who, you know, played songs and do this. He's, he did do a little bit of a record producing back in the day. And, and you knew you were on the ARR teams and uh, discovered guy, uh, guys, uh, or you helped out guys like Beck and you've been on a few, a few uh, pretty big projects too. So you're just not mm -hmm. someone who's like, Oh, I'm going to get in recording. Um, that is really, really awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what you get to go in there. All right. That is all we have for time. And I just want to give myself a little plug right now, Miles, if you don't have, if you don't mind, um, go something ahead, we do course. here, and this is just a, uh, this is what you want for anyone. If you're having, uh, we, you know, I am a tax attorney and this is how uh, I got into this is, and if you're having questions about your own tax returns, um, uh, if you want to just, uh, I'll review your, uh, last three years of tax returns for free. Um, uh, when you sign up for this year's tax prep or next year. Um, and to get started, very, very simple, just email me. There you go. If you get my email at aparent at irsmedic.com, any issues or anything like that, just send them to me. Um, and maybe you want to be a guest. So there it is. Just, just send my email. Um, final words, Miles, uh, what, what, uh, give us some encouragement. This is an amazing podcast. Give us, give us your final words. I am, I am just thrilled and I'm uh, absolutely honored to have you on here. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I, I would say, look, don't be so down on yourself that the expectations that we all place on ourselves can be overwhelming at times uh, but don't let the exterior put put those expectations on you without you vetting that they're really important to you i mean if somebody thinks that you you don't you're not wearing the right clothes or you're not driving the right car or whatever 
that's their perception. It's not yours. Okay. You do what makes you happy and make that your mission. And you're the center of everything. Let everything work around you. It works out really well. It's not selfish. It's just normal. And that's how we should be. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Miles. Um, looking forward to it. Um, and please uh, leave your comments below and be sure to check out uh, Miles' uh, podcast. I put some links in the chat right there where you can find them at unconstrained.com, uh, right? Is that what it is? Uh, be unconstrained. Be unconstrained.com. Yep. Um, you'll find that link in the comments, uh, so the super chat. So just follow it there and to follow Miles and learn more about him. I'm really, really a fascinating guy. Thank you so much, Miles. Thank you.